Hello everyone. This is a short lecture on batteries and how they work. I like to include um, a day on batteries because, you know, we do a chemistry unit in here and then we talk about electricity. Batteries are a good um, connection between chemistry and electricity because a battery is a power source that uses chemical reactions to provide the electric current. So, and the way they operate is not really very complicated. If you understand a few things, uh, basic things about uh, chemical reactions, you can understand the function of a battery. Uh, one of the first batteries was built by Alessandro Volta. This is a, uh, the scientist from whose name we get the volt, the unit of uh, electric potential. And what he did was build these uh, voltaic piles. So they contained disks of, of copper and then disks of zinc metal, and between those were brine-soaked paper. So brine being salt water, right? So this is something like sodium chloride or potassium chloride. Salt water like seawater or something was soaked on paper and put between these. And he found that if he, if he stacked these up, especially in, in large, tall stacks, and connected a wire between the ends, he could get electric current. And um, he didn't really know what was going on on a microscopic scale, we, we know now. But he, did, he discovered this by experiment. It's one of the interesting things about the history of science is that oftentimes people discover things by experimentation without really knowing what's going on. And then by further investigation, they learn what's going on. And this is how we find out what happens in the, in, uh, in the, the natural world. So. Now the chemistry that's going on in here is a little complicated. Let me um, talk about a slightly different chemistry that occurs in the what they call the alkaline batteries that you use in flashlights and other little battery powered things. It, uh, the most common type of battery is zinc manganese battery. So this chemical reaction takes place in the battery. Zinc reacts with manganese dioxide to form zinc oxide and what they call manganese 3 oxide. Now, when you see this chemical reaction, it's not at all obvious why you can get electricity out of this. But let me show you a little bit more detail to this reaction. What actually happens is there's two chemical reactions happening in different compartments of the battery. And those two half reactions, as they call them, can exchange particles in, in the total chemical reaction. So in one compartment, zinc reacts with these OHs. OH is called hydroxide and it's an oxygen connected to a hydrogen atom. And there's an extra electron. That's why the minus sign is there. It's an ion. Uh, so zinc combines with these hydroxides to make zinc oxide, a water molecule, and two free electrons. In the other compartment there's a reaction going on. Manganese dioxide combines with water molecule and two electrons to form manganese 3 oxide and two hydroxides. Now what do you notice about these two reactions? The first one uses up two hydroxides and produces a water molecule and two free electrons. The other reaction uses up a water molecule and two electrons and produces hydroxides. So if these uh, two reactions were happening in the same container, those two reactions would simply exchange those. One has the products that the other needs as a reactant and that has a, re has a product the other needs as a reactant. And they would just go back and forth, and that's why you would get this sort of bottom line for the chemical reaction. But, um, so if you can arrange a way where you can tap into that electron flow, electron flow is what? That's electricity. So, and that electricity will actually have some energy in it, which comes from the exothermic energy of these two reactions. So let me show you sort of how this is done. So here's one compartment of the battery, the top compartment, where the zinc turns into zinc oxide, releasing the electrons and water molecules. In the bottom, um, the manganese dioxide turns into, reacts with the electrons and water molecules to form manganese 3 oxide, producing hydroxides. Now there's a separator between the two compartments, which the water molecules can move through, and the hydroxides can move through, but it doesn't conduct electricity, so the electrons cannot move through it. You have to provide an external circuit for them to 
for the reaction to proceed, for those electrons to go from, from one compartment to the other. And let me show you how that's done. Here's the cross-section of one of these regular alkaline batteries, as they call them. There's zinc powder in the middle and manganese dioxide in the outer compartment. This thing is cylindrical, right, like a little battery. And um, the separator is usually cardboard, and this whole thing is soaked with, um, with some water and um, some ionic compound to make the water molecules and the hydroxides mobile in there. But, but the water molecules can move through and the hydroxides can move through that separator, but not the electrons. It doesn't conduct electricity. The electrons have to go in this metal pipe, and if you have a, an elect, uh, external circuit connected, like let's say you have a wire with a light bulb on it that you want to light, the electrons can flow through there, deliver their energy, and come back to this top electrode in, to, in order to get to the manganese dioxide compartment. So, you see, a battery is a really ingenious little device you find these two chemical reactions that exchange particles when they react, uh, including electrons, and you find a way to tap into that electron flow between the two. Now, if I don't have this battery hooked up to, uh, to something I want to power, the electrons can't get from one compartment to another. That stops the reaction. So if you take a battery and you just put it in a drawer, it'll, it won't go dead, right? It'll save that energy until you use it. And uh, so, the electron flow is part of the chemical reaction, so you have to give it that external circuit, which is the external circuit is the thing you want to power, like the bulb in your flashlight. So this is the most common type of uh, over-the-counter battery that you buy it in the store. Now, when the chemicals are gone in here, when the zinc's all turned into zinc oxide, and when the manganese dioxide is all turned into manganese 3 oxide, then the battery is dead. Right? It has no more chemical reactants. It can't provide electricity anymore. Wouldn't it be nice if you could recharge it by, say, either putting in new zinc powder, taking out the zinc oxide, and putting in manganese dioxide? Or, better yet, what if you just reverse the electron flow, causing the reactions to go backwards? Well, when you try that with this type of battery, it works a little bit, but not very well. The reaction doesn't reverse the same way. You get different products that you you get a different situation than you had to begin with, and it doesn't really charge up very well. There's another battery chemistry that does charge up better, and that is uh, nickel-cadmium. This is a, a nickel-cadmium battery. It's got a, it's an energizer product. It's got a green label on it because it's more eco-friendly because you can recharge it instead of throwing it away. Uh, but this reaction, it's a quite similar reaction. You exchange electrons between the two chemical reactions in the different compartments, uh, but it, <clears throat> if you reverse the electricity flow by putting it in a charger, it successfully reverses the chemical reactions. And these, I've had these for several years, uh, I've got a whole bunch of them, that I power a little um, weather station outside the science building, and I've recharged them hundreds of times, and they appear to work the same way they did when I bought them. So this is a, a battery chemistry that can be recharged. Now, uh, it's more expensive. These things cost a couple of times more than regular batteries, but if I had bought non-rechargeable batteries all this time, I would have spent thousands of dollars on these batteries. So, if you have an application where you, where you need to the, recharge the batteries often, um, then it pays to have a rechargeable chemistry. And, and of course, um, another type of battery that you recharge a lot is the battery in your cell phone. I'll talk about that in a bit. Now here's a cross-section of one of these nickel-cadmium batteries. Now you see these stripey things. These batteries actually have multiple cells, like in Volta's voltaic pile, uh, because, because just one of these cells only produces like 0.35 volts or something. And most over-the-counter batteries are designed to produce 1.5 volts, because things you power with these are designed to use 1.5 volt electricity. And uh, so they just stack a bunch of them in a row until you, you know, you add the voltage of, of many of the batteries stacked in a, in series, and that gives you a higher voltage. So I guess that's one of the things that makes this a more expensive type of battery. It has a more complicated structure on the inside because this nickel cadmium 
chemical reaction doesn't provide as much voltage. But you still get a 1.5 volt battery with this. Here is the battery chemistry that occurs in your cell phone. It involves the metal lithium, right? And uh, this is, again, highly rechargeable. You can recharge it many, many times. The great thing about a lithium battery is for per pound, it, had, it stores more energy than just about any other battery chemistry. So that's important if you want a lightweight battery. You don't want a big, heavy D cell in your cell phone. You want it to be lightweight. You want to be able to put it in your pocket. You want it to be lightweight in your hand. So um, a situation where we're on a lightweight battery, um, the, these lithium batteries are an advantage. But you can see there's two parallel chemical reactions that occur that exchange the electrons. Now the downside of the lithium batteries is they're expensive because lithium is a relatively rare element on the earth. And uh, so that just makes the batteries expensive. That's why cell phone batteries are so expensive to replace. Um, another type of battery is called a lead acid battery where both uh, half reactions involve the element lead. Now this is the type of battery that you have in your car that your car uses to start its engine when you turn the ignition key. Um, now the downside of lead batteries is that lead's heavy, right? It makes that battery in your car's 30 pound battery. Uh, but again, you can recharge it thousands of times before before it wears out. And so it's, it's very rechargeable, but just happens to be heavy. But your car doesn't care that a 30 pound battery is under the hood because your car can carry a lot of weight. So you can see this is a chemical reaction um, which involves, this is hydrous, uh, sulfuric acid, uh, which is why they call it a lead acid battery. And, and a lead acid battery, again, there's multiple cells in a row. This, one of these cells produces a little over two volts. So you put six of them in a row, you get a 12 volt battery. And, and car electrical systems are designed to operate on 12 volt electricity. So this is a, a good, uh, chemistry for for powering electrical systems in cars. So there's just a, a couple of battery chemistries and the, um, the important thing to remember about this is you don't have to remember the details of this chemistry but but people have figured out a way to tap into the electron flow between two half reactions this way in order to get usable electric power and um, so that's the, the basics of how batteries work.